Okay, thank you. All right, so we can we can begin. Um, and just to sort of, although it's not important for the talk, just to orient you where I'm from. So this is a satellite picture of the Mediterranean area. This is the Mediterranean. Um, Turkey is here. There's a lot of you know things from the news like Syria is here, Turkey is here, um, and uh, you know uh, uh, Greece is somewhere here and Italy is somewhere there, this is Egypt, this is the Nile. And I'm affiliated with Tel Aviv University, which is on the Mediterranean, but I'm actually from a field station down here, adjacent to the Red Sea. Um, and this is Israel, and Israel is quite small, as you know, so this is the size of Vancouver Island. Okay, so it's a very, very small place. And as you can see, it's an extreme desert. So these are not false colors. There are hardly any trees, um, and this is the marine station where I'm at. So, Extreme, extreme desert, and this is the sea. We have a nice or a small coral reef here. Fantastic place if you want to come and visit. Um, you're more than welcome. And Dolph already said a lot about my interests. Interests. All right. So the first question that we want to ask is where do fish babies come from? So you know, as you know, most marine fish basically have external fertilization, which means that the female releases the eggs and the male. Which went. <laughs> The females release, um, release eggs and the males release sperm. The fertilization takes place in the water. And this is a spawning aggregation of, um, of a brown tang, um, I think, or a tang of some sort. And this is, like, this is a mass spawning event. And although not all the fish have this mass spawning, this external fertilization is very characteristic, very characteristic of marine fish. It, it just happens almost across the species, regardless almost of size. And what happens is that the eggs that are released are characteristically very small. So the eggs are about one millimeter in diameter. They are released um, to the ocean. They develop for a couple of days, two days up to maybe five days, depending on species and temperature. And then the larvae, um, and then the larvae hatch. And this is the distribution of egg size. So as you can see, they're very, very small. The distribution is very narrow. All those eggs are tiny, and a tiny egg hatches from uh, a tiny larvae hatches from the egg. And these larvae have to survive um, and and sustain themselves in the ocean. Now, not all the um, not all the marine fish um, just you know broadcast their eggs. Uh, there are some who lay their eggs. Um, uh, demersally, so maybe um, in the reef you can see these, and this right there is Nemo, um, and you know, and and the eggs develop. Some brood uh, the larvae in their mouth, but still, after the larvae hatch, there is no parental care for the larvae. They are planktonic. They live in the open ocean, and they have to survive. Typically, though, we're talking about um, about those larvae with no parental care. That, uh, that hatch from the egg, and when the larvae hatch from the egg, they are, there's a reason why they're called larvae, right? They're very, very different from their adults. They don't have a skeleton. Their fins aren't, um, aren't formed yet, so they have this fin fold. Um, everything is cartilaginous, and the larvae feed on the yolk sac for a couple of days before the mouth actually opens. I think it's about here, okay? Um, and the larvae will start to feed. And during these during this development, which takes about three to um, three to four weeks, again depending on temperature and and species and so on, um, the larvae will develop from this thing, which lives on the remains of the yolk sac, to uh, and then the mouth will open. It will start feeding, and only then uh, the larvae will metamorphose and take the adult form and be ready to sort of set. And just to orient you, this is the this is the adult, it's a seabream, these are the larvae, and the size should look something like that, right? The larvae are much, much, much smaller, typically on the order of three to, I don't know, three millimeters to a centimeter. Okay, so what happens to the larvae? Obviously, the female will lay many thousands of eggs, hundreds of thousands, tens, tens of thousands of eggs, and um, the hatching larvae typically suffer from a very high mortality rate. But it's not only that they suffer from mortality rates, mortality peaks right after the mouth is open and the larvae starts to feed. So this is what's known as the critical period of larval fish. This is a term coined by uh, John Hort, a Nor Norwegian um, 
biological ethnographer that lived about 100 years ago, and this describes the time, and this is the number of eggs in a, in a, a theoretical population, and what you see here is the decline in the number of eggs, and then suddenly you got this huge dip in the number of, uh, in the number of, of, of larvae, and note that this is a logarithmic scale. So about 99% of the larvae die during this period when the, first, when the mouth is open and the larvae starts to feed until about two or three days later when the larvae are sort of metamorphosed. And I'm citing from, I'm citing from Hortz that said that failing to find suitable prey in sufficient quantity, over 90% mortality occurs soon after larvae absorb their yolk and initiate feeding. And according to Hort, this is um, this is a general phenomenon. It's not a species dependent. He he looked at that multi across multiple species and, and thought that this is a, a very consistent pattern. Okay, so people immediately started to get interested and asked themselves, you know, what's happening here? And the obvious that the, the obvious suspects were uh, predation, attraction to unsuitable habitats. Right, these larvae are tiny and they just get drift. In the ocean, maybe they would be, uh, they would get drifted to areas with no no sufficient oxygen, no sufficient prey, um, diseases, failure to find uh, failure to find food. All these were uh, were mentioned as possible mechanisms for this great mortality. But still, in the last maybe 50, 30 years, we're doing a very large experiment to test that hypothesis, and this is called mariculture. So in mariculture, there's no advection. The larvae have plenty of food. Um, we know when a disease happens or not, and um, and obviously there's there's no predation. And still, even in good conditions, there is like 70% mortality of the brood. So the company that I get to work with are that they put a million eggs in one of these huge chambers, and if they get 300,000 fish, they're very happy. This is a very successful. So something happens there that. You know that, that affects this mortality, and my sort of my quest. The quest in my lab was to find out what what's happening. What is the role for the larval mortality? And being you know, being a, a functional morphologist and, and basically just a fish nut, um, I thought about about what's going on, and I started thinking about the way that fish feed. And I started to think whether this can potentially explain this pattern of high mortality rates during development. So how do fish feed? As I guess you all know, or everybody that attended Peter Wainwright's talk, uh, fish mostly feed by suction feeding. Suction feeding works mostly in the water, um, and it uses the, 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 the physical properties of the water. So what you will see here, this is a, this is a high speed video. It's taken at 500 frames per second. So it's like 25 times faster than most cameras. These are, this is the predator. This is the prey, and what the, the, the predator is going to advance towards the fish, open its mouth, expand the buccal cavity, and generate an external flow of water that drags the prey into the mouth. Because you, uh, you didn't say the wow, um, I'll have to play it again. There has to be a wow, otherwise we're not leaving. Um, I mean, this is real. So, <laughs> Yeah, that was great. So, so what you should note, though, is that there's no connection between the fish and its prey, right? It's all about the flow of water that drags the prey into the mouth. This is like, you know, Luke Skywalker getting his lightsaber, right? So it, it, the fish is actually exerting force on an object without touching it. It's, it's really, really interesting. OK, and so. Okay, so um, all right. So so we were interested. So during my postdoc, I was interested in what exactly is going on here, and uh, I will not get into too many details. But we wanted to actually see those um, water currents that drive the prey in. So we trained our fish to feed in this laser light sheet. This is a laser light sheet. This is the prey. This is our fish. We trained them to come and feed, and we could see actually the water flow into the mouth. 
and this is like a zoom in picture that's the tip of the jaws of the fish this is our prey and these are just glass particles very very small they don't harm the fish and you will actually see them because they're sh the, the laser is shining on them you will see them as they go inwards um, towards the, the, the mouth of the fish so this is the suction flow this is the flow that the fish is generating to get the prey and we were able to actually measure the forces that the fish exert so this is another shrimp this time glued to a force transducer and you see the record <laughs> of the force here. Um, yep, and you can see that the fish can exert pretty high forces actually um, on its prey. He's trying once, <laughs> three times. And this actually enabled us to, to learn something about the mechanism, right? What traits are important in this process? So there he goes, third time. Woohoo! <laughs> And the video is cut because now he gets tired and he just yanks the thing with his, with his teeth. So, um, you know, they don't really expect the, 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 the shrimp to be attached to anything. All right, but that's a really great mechanism. Most of the fish feed this way. And even um, animals that went back to the water or ver other vertebrates that went back to the water have, have re-evolved suction feeding in order to capture prey. So it's a really, really great mechanism for capturing prey. So, you know, why would I have an a priori hypothesis that larvae, that, you know, that this would be somehow crooked or wrong in larval fish? Well, I mean, I had my reasons. And, and my hypothesis was that the hydrodynamic regime constrains suction feeding in low Reynolds number. So I'll explain it. I mean, you already know what suction feeding is. Um, but do you remember what Reynolds number is? Anybody knows it? Okay. So Reynolds number is, is basically a property of of the flow regime. It's, uh, it's one of these dimensionless, dimensionless numbers used by, uh, used by engineers to, um, to describe the hydrodynamic regime of an object in the flow. And it's basically the relationship between the inertial forces that operate on, um, on an object and the drag forces that operate on it. And, you know, to, to make a long story short, um, this is so if this is the, the equations, and what you can see here that this is length and this is velocity. So the longer the length and the higher the velocity, the higher the Reynolds number is. So let me just give you some sort of an intuition or to explain to you what's going on. The, the smaller you are, the more you tend to feel the water as a viscous fluid. Okay? What happens is, is you know that water has these uh, weak electrical forces. So when an object is immersed in water, there's a small layer of water that, that gets adhered to the, to the object, right? So there's a thin layer of water surrounding the object. For us, we're large organisms. So you know, if you have a little bit of water attached to your skin, you don't even feel it. But imagine a very tiny larvae with, a, with a, um, a thin layer of water around it, it actually feels that it's dragging something, right? So these are, the, these are those forces. Now, as, uh, as large organisms, we have very weak grasp of what life in low Reynolds number are. So I've got uh, an experiment for you. Usually I have this contraption, but I didn't bring it to Canada with me. Um, so I'll just play it. It's not a hoax, it's, it's real. So we have two cylinders here, and the cylinders here are, are filled um, in the middle, they're filled with um, corn, corn syrup, so this is a very viscous, um, this is a very viscous uh, uh, um, um, fluid. And what's going to happen is that these experimenters are going to uh, put some dye in, the, um, uh, in, this viscous, in this viscous fluid, and they are going to turn the, the inner cylinder, okay? So they are going to mix the, um, they are going to mix this thing. So, as you know, um, when you take your coffee and you put sugar in and you mix several times to one direction, the sugar will dissolve, right? And then if you mix backwards, the sugar will not reform, right? It, it mixes very well. So what happens here? And I'll try to just fast, fast forward because it really takes a long time. Okay, so they mixed it. Everything is mixed thoroughly. They're mixing to the other direction. The video is very consistent. It 
happens every time. <laughs> so again, this is not a hoax. I'm not, you know, sort of playing back. It's real, and, and I've got the contraption, and you can actually do it. It's not that difficult. And what happens, this is a result of the, of the low Reynolds numbers. It, it, the flow, the, the, the particles of, in the flow lose their sort of individuality. They move together. And flow is reversible and viscous and is very different from the, from the flow, um, from, from flow patterns generated in high Reynolds numbers. And fish or larval fish are known to live in low Reynolds numbers and there has been a lot of attention directed to how they swim and another corollary, so these are larval fish swimming in a petri dish and you should just know, note how these guys um, swim in bouts. So what happens is unlike fish, unlike large fish, there is no inertia. These guys can't just stop swinging their tail and glide forward. There's no gliding, there's no inertia, okay? So these guys, as long as they wiggle their tail, they will move, and as they stop, they, they freeze. Okay, so maybe the low Reynolds number does something for their ability to suction feed, their ability to properly move the water um, as they suck the fluid into their mouth. So we set up an experiment to test that. We took our larval fish, these are Sparus aurata larvae, and we fed them with rotifers. This is the prey that everybody in Mari culture uses. The nice thing about, uh, about rotifers is that they have this um, mustex, which is a chitinous object um, that is used to grind the, 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 the prey of the rotifers or something like that. And what you can do is you can let the, the larvae feed and count the number of mustex object in their gut. So it's a very nice way to calculate how much they ate. Of course, you have to sacrifice the larvae. Um, and so we quantified the feeding rates for larvae starting at eight days post-hatching, so a couple of days, like two or three days after they actually started feeding. Um, that's the beginning of the critical period. At an age of um, 24 days post-hatching, that's the end of the critical period. Most larvae will survive. And at the middle of the critical period. So these were the results. Um, small larvae ate very little, um, large larvae ate a lot, and intermediate larvae you know, had an intermediate feeding rate. And so, yeah, I think I'll take questions now. Well, I mean, obviously that didn't prove anything, right? I mean, it could be that those larvae just didn't want to eat or just, you know, they, they need less food, they're less energized, they swim slower, or it could be that we're actually looking at selection here, right? So these are, this is like the pool. These are all the guys, the better guys that survived halfway. And these are the, you know, this is the elite class. So that could be happening. So we first took a stab at looking at how larvae feed. And I'm just saying it like it's a, an easy thing, but actually my students worked very, very, very hard uh, to get this massive data set. I mean, to get this data set, it's not massive, but it's, it was a lot of work. And that's because the larvae are very, very small. Anyway, it's a lot of effort to film them if you want to hear the stories. Talk to me later. Um, but basically, we used the high-speed uh, video camera, and we were working. This aquarium is made out of... Uh, like microscope uh, slides, so the larvae are really tiny there, you can see them there. And we were waiting for the larvae to feed and then filmed them. Um, and then we recorded 20 minutes of high speed video and then people had to look at it and, and determine, determine where do the larvae try and, um, and feed. And then we could test what's happening, what's the ontogenetic pattern of feeding success? How often do larvae succeed? And what you see clearly, this is age, this is the success of the age class, and what you see is an increase in feeding success um, with age. So the smallest days post-hatching larvae fail about 80% of the time. And we're talking uh, rotifers, which is a prey that is not evasive. All they have to do is get it into the mouth, but they fail four out of five times. For the larger larvae, they're you know, mostly successful. 80% of the time, the prey gets in the mouth and stays in the mouth, and they're very successful. Okay, and, and I'll just show you. So this is a 30 days post-hatching um, Sparrows larvae. This is the prey. It's, again, a high-speed movie, this time at 1,000 frames per second, and it looks pretty much like, um, it looks pretty much like, the, like the, the petunia that I showed you, right? Like the, the, large, the large fish. This is what happens to smaller larvae, as we say, they're much less successful. So that's the prey right here. <laughs> OK, nothing. That's the prey right here. <laughs> and 
And the prayer here goes into the mouth and slips out. <laughs> and that's the prayer here. And well, anyway, it goes and it goes and it goes. The, the, last, the last sort of capture, even this, like, goes in and then goes out again. Um, I saved one good strike at the end, right, to sort of cheer everybody up. Um, but these guys have a really, really, really hard time of getting the prey inwards, OK? Um, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> OK, so, so we, have, we have a good grasp of, of the fact that larvae somehow fail, right? Small larvae somehow fail to get the prey into the mouth. But we still haven't talked about hydrodynamics at all. I mean, large larvae and small larvae are very different. I just showed you, right? The, the, the skeleton haven't formed, and the muscle aren't developed, and now there's a lot of work on the sensor-motor, sensory-motory, nora, neural connection, right? Maybe they're just not well coordinated. Maybe the vision isn't, um, you know, isn't developed enough. There could be a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, um, a lot of other correlates, right? Things change in this ontogeny. And so how do you separate? How do you actually separate these sort of ontogenetic axes and, and physical axes, which are highly correlated? So we thought a lot about it and actually you know, bumped into the, the correct answer. And it turns out that there are a lot of polysaccharides that can change the viscosity of the water without changing any other property. So without changing diffusion and without being um, nutritious for the fish. And one of these components is uh, dextran. And it's actually used in pharmaceutical um, industry, and you can add it to the water. And what happens is when you when you think about the Reynolds equation, okay, which is length times speed times density divided by the viscosity of the water. If you increase the viscosity of the water two times, so your 10 millimeter larvae will feel will be in a. And so you would you can isolate the effects on the hydro of the hydrodynamic environment without changing any of these other parameters that are related to ontogeny. And this is exactly what we did. We took our larvae from the previous experiment, we put them in petri dishes, we let them feed for half an hour, and we determined their feeding rate. But now we took those three age classes and we increased, gradually increased the viscosity um, of the water in which they swim. Right? And our hypothesis was that their feeding rate will decrease as a function of the viscosity of the water. Sure enough, this is what we got, right? So these are the three age classes. This is like raw data um, with increasing water viscosity. But what you can do is you can now plot this as a function of Reynolds number, not as a function of the relative water viscosity. And this is what we got. So this is the dynamically scaled size. This is the equivalent size of the larvae. If we took a 10 millimeter larvae and increase viscosity by two, then the equivalent size would be five millimeter, right? So we can calculate that for all our size classes. And what you can see here is that feeding rate is determined by the dynamically scaled size, irregardless of age. Age was not significant in the statistical model. In other words, fish of 23 days post-hatching, 14 days post-hatching, and eight days post-hatching feed at the same rate, okay? that is determined by the dynamically scaled size. So what he tells you is that the hydrodynamic, um, the hydrodynamic regime determines, by and large, the feeding rate of these guys. OK, we were very, very excited to, to learn that. Um, but still, you know, we had, we had a doubt, because we know that, these, um, that, that the feeding rate is not determined only by capture success, right? It also determined by encounter rate. That's very basic in ecology. And we know that the Reynolds number affects the swimming speed. So maybe it's all, it's all an encounter rate program. It's all only um, an encounter rate problem. So basically, we, uh, we try to model it. We use the parameters that we observed. So the, feeding, the swimming speed um, of our fish in our experiment that we filmed, um, the prey density, and uh, the, 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 the encounter probability. And what we saw, this is again, this is now the normalized feeding rate. So one is the highest feeding rate. And the dashed line are the outcome of the model. And this is the observed. So what this figure tells you is that, yes, there is some effect of swimming speed. So, so the slower swimming speed in more dense, in more viscous water um, will decrease feeding by about 30%. But um, 
the something in the, in the suction feeding mechanism has a much larger effect. So it affects about 70% of the observed variance. All right. So to, to sort of make a quick break and summarize a little bit, we saw that feeding rates increase with age. Um, we, I've showed you that feeding success also increases with age, uh, with age and that viscos viscosity reduced the feeding rates. We saw a weak effect uh, of age on the above patterns compared to viscosity in our, in our manipulative experiments. And um, overall, we, 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 um, uh, we saw or we, we, uh, we deduced that there's a very strong effect of viscosity on suction performance. OK, so we were very happy. But, but one thing did strike us, strike us as you know, worth finding out. It, it's this. OK, so I understand you know, cases where the fish just fail. Larvae just suck at suction feeding. Um, and definitely, this is easy, right? So they, they pass this threshold of low viscosity. They get larger, and they can move the water faster. So they, they go into a, a regime of high Reynolds number. What sort of what happens here? So why do some larvae succeed and, and some larvae fail? What's, what's sort of the proximal mechanism that determines failure and success, right? Within the same age or within yeah, within the same age. So is it that some larvae are larger and are more successful? Maybe some, some other, what's, what's happening here? Which traits are actually responsible for determining success and failure in those larvae that not always succeed? So to find out, um, we did a very, it's a, it's kind of a complex experiment. So this is uh, two cameras, each one with a beam splitter looking at the same larvae from all directions. And our idea was to really measure precisely the kinematics, the movements in this predator-prey um, interaction, and see whether we can determine which kinematic traits will affect, um, will affect success and failure. And we had a couple of hundred uh, uh, um, observations. And we could basically look at which traits are different between failed strikes, successful strikes, and strikes that we, that we categorized as in and out. So you saw in this video, right, that there are sometimes the prey goes into the mouth. And then before the mouth is closed, or when the mouth is closing, it will sort of eject outside. Um, and so you know, there's, there are a bunch of, of traits that are different. Um, fish that, that success open their mouth bigger. Um, they're slightly longer. Um, they initiate their strike from closer range. They swim faster. Anyway, there's a lot of traits that, that differ. And in order to maybe try and understand which, which traits drive this separation between successful and failure strikes, we applied um, DFA. So uh, uh, um, I'm blanking on the uh, discriminant. discriminant function analysis. Thank you. Um, and this is basically an analysis which, given the data, tries to formulate a function of which variables contribute more, more to the separation between your predefined categories. And this is what we show. So these are the failed strikes. These are the in and outs. And these are the successful strikes. And the, the analysis explained, I think, overall about 90% of the variation between failed and successful strikes. And what, so you can see that you know, they're separated on this similarity axis. Um, and what, what was the, 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 the two variables that overwhelmingly explained this was the Reynolds number. And you can calculate the Reynolds number in the scale of the entire fish. So we call it the swimming Reynolds number, right? That's the length of the fish and its swimming speed, right? You remember that there's length and viscosity in the Reynolds equation. You can also calculate the Reynolds number for feeding. And there, the length will be the size of the mouth. And, the, 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 and we estimated the speed of the flow that's going into the mouth. So we had these two Reynolds numbers, and they and this shows that they're on a, on a strike by strike basis, right? They're the ones that are they are the ones that are contrib contributing to the separation. And I can tell you that that we we did further analysis and we and it showed two things. So basically, to to separate these two, we used um, uh, we used structural equation modeling, and it showed us that basically it's the uh, Reynolds number at the gape. So it's the Reynolds number that is determined by the effort of the fish that determines the strike outcome. So larva length, 
larger larvae did swim at larger Reynolds number, but did, it did not contribute, it did not explain the variation in strike outcome. And the Reynolds number for suction feeding basically was, um, was also or was, was largely affected by the effort of the larvae. So larvae that could actually open their mouth faster and, um, and open their mouth wider, and consequently they could generate faster flows into the mouth, had higher probability to succeed. So within these cohorts, within these cohorts, you will see some individuals that somehow make it, some individuals that are stronger or in be better physical condition that are the ones that can actually um, run those faster flows and can achieve Reynolds, high Reynolds number um, uh, and can sort of escape the viscous of low Reynolds numbers. Okay, so we got that and we still wanted to, to understand, okay, so how, what's the mechanism here? What's sort of, okay, there's, there's you know, Reynolds number, that's like an, uh, that's a unidimensional number. It's maybe, it's, it's a little bit of a, um, uh, just a concept, right? But what exactly is happening to the flow that is driving, that is driving the, the, the low success? So we turned out to, uh, to a technology that is called um, uh, computational fluid dynamic. Computational fluid dynamic is, is a sort of hydrodynamic modeling where you have a solid object and the, the, the shape of the solid, the solid object is defined by the user. And you can simulate the flow of whatever it is, fluid or air, that is moving through the water. So, you know, Boeing used those things when they make a 787 to make sure that it doesn't just fall out of the sky when they fly it the first couple of times. Not always working. Um, but it, it's really used throughout. And the thing is that it's, we're s actually, it works by actually solving the fundamental equations of water movement across a boundary. So they're called uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. They're ugly. You don't actually solve them by hand. The computer does that. They're nasty partial, equation, partial differential equations, and they're basically solved numerically and iteratively over your computational grid. And if you want to hear more about it, I'll, uh, we can discuss it after the, after the talk. But what it al allows you to do is to take the mouth, and this is our um, really simplified uh, version of the mouth, and you, and you simulate it, and you just simulate the mouth to open. And now I can change. Um, now I can, I can create my own ontogenetic series. I can just make the mouth bigger or smaller, and I can ask what, happening to, what happens to the fluid. So this is the solid body. That's the mouth opening, and these nodes represent our computational nodes, and we're solving the movement of water particles in each point um, in space around the expanding mouth. So this is our mouth. It's opening in a certain kinematic, and now we can just change the size uh, to make it bigger and smaller. And sort of, I will not go into too much into the details. It's, it's a fairly technical thing. I just want you to see this is the, the, the flow pattern of a large um, fish. This is the flow pattern at the mouth of, the, of, a, small of, of a really small larvae. The kinematics is the, is the same. So the movement is the same. Uh, the entire difference is the Reynolds numbers. Um, and so red. It, the, the flows aren't scaled. Obviously, they're much slower in this guy, but we just scaled them artificially. So red is, is strong flow, and um, blue is weak flows. And you can see, I mean, you don't have to understand um, too much, but you can see that the flow pattern is very different. So in the big fish, basically, the flows, there's, there, there are sharp gradients in front of the mouth. And in the larvae, the gradients are much smoother, and the flow is, is like lingering. Okay, and turns out that this is an important, and that's like a summary. So this is the smallest mouth, and this is a bigger and bigger and bigger mouth. And what you see is that these, is that um, the gradients become steeper as the size of the larvae increase. And what, what happens, or we were able to actually um, calculate how much force is exerted on prey that sits in this suction suction flow, and what happens is that these lingering gradients actually weakens the force exerted on the prey. So if you put your copepod or your prey here, it will, it will not 
tend to move into the mouth, or it will have lower force that drags it into the mouth. Um, and and so, yeah. And so this is uh, this is. So if if you if you simulate that, if you ask yourself, okay, what's the force that exerted on the prey um, of different uh, of different larvae? So of different size fish or larvae. So this is the larvae. Larvae can only capture very weak. This is the, the force that the prey have to exert to escape. So small larvae only capture very weak, weakly escaping prey at a very short distance. And as they grow, um, exert higher forces on their prey, and they can capture better escaping prey. And um, Lenz and uh, Jackson and Lenz repeated or followed up on this prediction, and they saw um, in amphiprion larvae, so this is larval age, they're feeding on nauplii, which cannot escape, copepodites and copepods, and you know, according to the prediction, better escaping prey will just not be captured by these larvae, um, whereas they're better at capturing weakly escaping prey. And still, um, capture success is low um, for these larvae. Okay, so the last point, the last sort of point that this, this enabled us to look at is the in and out events. Um, and, and basically what we think is happening, and I'll skip, the, I'll skip the, the, the graphics of it, but I'll play them anyway. Um, so basically what we could do is, is look at the, uh, the movement of particles into the mouth as a function of Reynolds number and look at what's happening, what's the fate of particles, and quantify actually how much backflow there is as a function of the age. And what we think is happening here, and this is unfortunately a work of a master student that did not complete the project, but what we think is happening is that at low Reynolds number, so in fish, the mouth is expanding, and then it, the mouth is closing, and most of the water will leave through the gills. In a low Reynolds number environment, those gills are actually an impediment to the flow. So what we think is that more water is, is going out of the mouth and taking um, and taking the prey back outside of the mouth. Um, okay, I think I've got time for one for one last point. And uh, and okay, so I think I've shown you, hopefully convincingly, um, that the Reynolds number affects the suction flow inside and outside the mouth. Um, these in the Reynolds number affect to capture prey, and. Well, we, don't, we haven't talked about that, but they're also important for the distribution of prey in the mouth. And overall, what I think I showed you is that smaller larvae that live on, in a lower Reynolds environment have lower ability to feed, and they fail more. But does this really affect their nutrition ability? Does that really have an effect on the larvae? You know, do they, would they actually starve? Maybe if they feed... And maybe they can still feed enough. Maybe they, they can still make it in this world, right? And so our question was, does that really drive starvation and possibly death? And we went and we went and tested it using a gene, using gene expression assays. So we're using the AGRP. This is a conserved hunger neuropeptide across vertebrates. So you have that as well. And turns out that this is a neuropeptide that is uh, secreted by the... Um, by the um, hypophysa and by the brain. And basically, it, its, ex, its expression increases at acute hunger. So it's not, you know, the gene is not higher now when you think about your lunch. But if I'll starve you for a couple of days, then the level of AGRP or the expression of AGRP will increase. And it has known effects on, on metabolism that are associated, um, you know, with changing the metabolism to. Um, to well, changing the changing the metabolism to uh, um, the changing fat metabolism and and sugar metabolism, etc. And basically, you could ask what happens to the expression of these peptides of these neuropeptides throughout ontogeny. So our method was first to make sure that this is that the gene is expressed at the right place, and this this is an in situ hybridization, and the gene is expressed in the um, in the right place in the in the brain, and What's also is that if you compare the expression pattern between starved and fed fish, then you'll see that I think these are, these, are, um, these are starved fish, these are fed fish. So in starved fish, the expression of the gene is much higher. The expression level is much higher. Okay? So what can we do now? We can compare 
the level of expression between fed fish, fish that got ad libitum um, food, and starved fish in the different ages. And we can ask, you know, what's the difference? What's that difference um, between starved and fed fish across ages? And what we get is a decrease in the expression of AGRP. So in the eight days post hatching, even though they were fed ad libitum, they had access to as much food as they needed, they weren't significantly different from that one uh, line. So their expression pattern was not different than uh, the fed guys. Whereas 13 days post hatching and 18 days post hatching, the, the older the larvae are, the, the less hung, hungry they are when they get unlimited uh, amount of food. Okay, so what? So the so the summary uh, or, or or to conclude all this is we saw that feeding rate and feeding success increase with size, and this is we think due to a strong effect of the viscosity on suction feeding performance. Small RV can only capture small and weakly escaping prey, and overall the 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 constraints on their feeding um, on their feeding success. Um, tells us that they experience what we call hydrodynamic starvation. Starvation that is not related to the abundance of food, or not so much related to the abundance of food, but that is related to the hydrodynamic conditions in which they feed, and I think could, um, could be responsible to the mortality at first feeding. Okay, and now you're probably asking, well, I mean, this is a weird story, right? Because if this is the case, then how come we don't have larger eggs, right? I mean, where is selection? So under these really extreme mortality rates, all you have to do is to drive that distribution a little bit to the, to the left, right? And, and you solve everything. And so if you ask people that, are, um, that do this uh, life, um, uh, that, that you know, model um, the, the life strategies and stuff, they, they will tell you, no, no, we got it solved because if mortality is high and unpredictable, it pays to have um, very or a lot of smaller prop propagules with each one, each individual have lower chances of survivorship, but that would increase, um, increase overall survivorship. It could be, I have a, another hypothesis, is that actually if you, go, if you grow much larger, then you cannot sustain enough oxygen to the developing embryo because the, re the relationship between um, the um, surface area and volume will decrease with, increase, with increasing, age, with increasing um, um, volume of the egg. But I don't know, it remains to be tested. Anyway, um, there, a lot of people put a lot of work into this um, research, including Victor, who was a PhD student, Liraz, uh, who was a master's student, and a couple of other students and postdoc that, that did bits and parts of this, and um, a lot of people were generous enough to actually give me money to do it, and um, for which I'm really thankful. And thanks for you for listening. Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. Um, I don't I don't have so you know the good thing and the bad thing. I uh, I was working with a company that breeds larvae um, commercially, and they were just giving me larvae to use. Um, they had a, a couple of breeding stocks. These are not from the same breeding stock that we we use. Uh, they have like um, I don't know ten breeding stocks or more, I think. And and so the the, the paternity changed there. Um, we, we yeah. We, we don't have our own fish growing facility in which we could do these controlled experiments. Um, it's a good thing because I don't have to worry about um, breeding fish, but it's a bad thing because I don't know anything about their sort of heritage. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the short answer is no, I have no idea of those things. There's, there's definitely a lot of plasticity. So we, we, did, we did run an experiment to try and correlate egg size to success, to feeding success, and 
It didn't work, but we did show that there's a lot of, that there is variation in, like in egg size within the, within the same stock, within the same egg stock. So, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, how much does the morphology of larvae, uh, particularly the trophic morphology, vary amongst uh, different species? And, I mean, would you expect certain species to be particularly wimpy in terms of the feeding and low Reynolds numbers and others to be slightly better based on some morphological attribute? I, I know they're all, all larvae to me kind of look the same. <laughs> So um, there is, yeah, there is an open position to a graduate student in my lab to ask just this question. <laughs> um, the, the, again, the short question, the, so, the short answer is that we're not really sure. Um, they are, at least they appear very, very similar to one another. And I think my, my educated guess at this point is that they're all very similar and they're all really constrained. But exactly how, how much functional variation are there between species? I have a very vague, um, I, I don't have a good quantitative answer. We did look at, um, at l um, larval labrid fishes. So these are like the red sea, the, the uh, coral reef, um, you know, fish, the, the parrotfish and, and cleaners and stuff. And there we were surprised to see that there is good separation between, um, between larvae of different species, of different, well, not, not of different species, but Larvae that, that whose adults belong to different trophic groups. So the larvae of zooplankton feeders were more similar to, to older larvae of zooplankton feeders than to older larvae of, say, parrotfishes. Um, so, but, but yeah, so I don't know. Like across, across different larvae, I, I just have very weak grasp of yeah, how much. Yeah. So, um, so you don't. So eggs are small, and suggesting, and they're small cross species, suggesting there's not selection pressure for them to be larger across the board. How, what proportion of larvae would have to die? About to be? yeah. Well, depending on how many uh, how many eggs are spawned, right? But uh, but basically, there's no correlation whatsoever between the the size of the adult and the size of the eggs. But there's a there's a nice correlation between the size of the adults and the number of eggs. So for tuna, say the number, the, the the mortality rate is much higher than in smaller than in smaller fish. Um, the other thing, um, the other thing that I want to say is that in fish that have parental care, egg size can reach um, much much lower, much higher values. So parental care is associated with better eggs, but it fits both explanations. So, you know, the environment is less stochastic because there's parental care. So you'd expect better investment in each one of the, um, of the eggs. And on the other hand, one of the, one of the behaviors of the, of the parents is to aerate the fish. So they actually augment the, the flow of water around the egg, and that increases uh, the flux of oxygen. So I, that doesn't give us a hint about what mechanism is. Yeah. Uh, Two ideas, one is more of a joke, one is more serious. Uh, the more jokey one, so it looks like if I want to make, uh, increase the number of larvae in, if I have like a fishery industry, I would just put some soap into the water, uh, choose the soap wisely so I don't poison them. But it looks like I just need to reduce the Reynolds number of the, of the tank and then suddenly the feeding uh, success goes up. It's a great, it's a great idea. You, you're not looking for a surfactant. Which will which will in, which will decrease the the the, um, the surface tension. You're looking for something that will reduce yeah. the the viscosity, and and we actually thought about it. And this would be a great idea if I could patent that. I'd be rich, um, and I did. You know, I did have it, a fantasy of where I'm doing it. But unfortunately, things that lower the, that lower the, the Reynolds number are highly toxic. They're usually benzene and acetone and turpentine, <laughs> and the larvae just refuse to grow. So, okay. but it's a, it's a great, it's a great comment. Uh, but by the way, um, temperature does decrease viscosity, but you have to really crank up temperature. Um, and you, you know, you run into, yeah, you run into other problems. Uh, <laughs> so the second uh, yeah. idea that came to me was regarding the problem of why the eggs are not, or the larvae are not bigger to begin with, and, and you know, why, 
where, where should, why do we, we have those not tied into a larger, and that, uh, from your plot, it looks like, and from the formula about the Reynolds number, it looks like um, the, 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 or the inverse of the viscosity, or the, the, the feeding rate is at most linear in uh, the size of the larvae, the linear size of the larvae, so the length, for example. So if you double the length, you at most double the feeding success, at least within a certain, just based on your data. Uh, whereas if you double the length, you, what's the word for that? Two to the power of third fold, whatever the word for right. you, you make eight, you need right. eight. You need more biomass, mass. yeah. Mass. So basically the, the, bio, the, the mass of the larvae increases in the, with the cube of the length, where the success rate only linear with the length. And that would imply that you can't just at infimum incre increase the size and proportionally increase the rate, the, the, the right. success, because if you, you know what, what I'm getting at? Like You're, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful point, um, but actually what you should remember is that it also gives you access. So increasing Reynolds number will also give you access to better prey and to larger prey. Okay. So, so this is in terms of success, but I can also show you, like, it, it would also increase your success on larger, better evasive prey. Um, so, so yes, it, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I could make these calculations, basically. Uh, we, yeah, but... Uh, An explanation like that would explain also why yeah. bigger fish don't make bigger larvae, because the optimum is actually simply determined by where... Uh, you know, where the nonlinearity meets the linearity yeah. and where you have that optimal success times possible number of x. So it would explain why there is such a thing as an optimal size, even though uh, you could make more x if you're a bigger fish. Uh, anyway, just something Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, does the number of mice in the Oh, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, it's... Absolutely. So the Reynolds number, basically, you can calculate for, for every process in which a solid meets, um, a, solid meets a, a fluid. And it's, it, it is in, it's really important in determining that sort of the interaction of what happens um, in that interaction, how, how things sort of respond to one another. Yeah. Maybe one more question. So you'll choose the speaker because I don't want to. So nonlinear uh, of viscosity and what? Sorry. Metabolic. So with metabolic rates, I don't know the specifics of these fish. Um, with, in terms of viscosity, it's it's nonlinear, um, and so to change viscosity by if you change temperature by about five degrees, so from twenty to twenty-five, not you know in the in the range where we where we did the experiments, you change viscosity by basically ten to. 15%, so not that much. Um, there is an interesting case of, you know, very, very cold water, which are twice as viscous as 20% seawater. So in Antarctica, you have these not attenuated fish, and they produce huge eggs and huge larvae. And I think it has to, it has to do with, you know, being in an equivalent Reynolds numbers. And but I haven't tested these yet. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking with respect to starving. Um, if warming causes your viscosity to go up, then um, but it also causes your metabolic rate to go up. You might find that the relative temperature might be better. But it, yeah, I mean it's it's a little bit more complicated than that probably because it also um, increases the speed of the motion of muscles, so it might um, increase Reynolds number and. So, but it can be calculated. Yeah, definitely. It's a good point. Thank you. So, Roy, can we run the last question for the next? Uh, yeah. Uh, meantime, thanks for Thank you. <laughs>